Good morning, church. Welcome to worship. This past week, I hope you've been able to anchor yourself into God's word and that your life has been blessed as a result of that. This morning, we come together and we're going to be talking about decision making and tough decisions and how trusting God makes tough decisions easier. I pray that you're blessed this morning as we worship together. Welcome. Glad you're here. Hey church, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, first and foremost with thankful hearts. We just wanna say thank you. Thank you for the, the many blessings that you bestow upon us. Thank you for being both a great powerful God who is above all 
and yet at the same time, a loving, kind and intimate friend who's close, who is interested in our lives, who is at work in our lives. We find rest and comfort and hope in knowing that. But God, life can be difficult sometimes. So I want to lift up in this moment all of those members and uh, people in our church who may be going through a difficult season in their lives. I can think of a few names, Lord God, but I know there may be more. And I know that you know them well. I know that you know what they're going through. Lord God, I pray that if there's anyone who's feeling sad and down and lonely, I pray that your embrace and your presence would be upon them. God, I pray that if there's anyone in our church who is facing a tough choice, a difficult decision to make, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with them, giving them wisdom, discernment. Lord God, I pray that if there's anyone in our church who is experiencing illness, perhaps the illness of a loved one, I pray, Lord God, that your powerful healing touch would be upon them. Show your glory in our church, Lord God, that we may praise you and lift you up. God, we now turn our attention to the word that you have for us. I know that you've inspired Pastor Gary with a message for each one of us today. So help us by the power of your spirit to pay attention, to give our, all our attention to this moment. By the power of your spirit, open our hearts and open our minds that we may receive your word and be transformed by it today. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. Thank you for being a good father. And thank you, Jesus, for being a friend and for dying on the cross for us, for giving your all, for laying down your life on our behalf. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work you're doing in our hearts to convince us and convict us of this truth and to bring us to Jesus. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Being church in a post-pandemic world, we're exploring and continuing our series of thinking about what does it mean to be the church in this post-pandemic world? As we consider what could the church be, what should the church be in this post-COVID world? Well, one thing is obvious, we're dealing with a new reality, right? I mean, the world around us has changed dramatically and quickly. Now, some of us are energized by change. But others, in fact, probably most of us, find change to be difficult. And it, it challenges us. It's, it's even painful. And for some of us, we'll fight change tooth and nail, right? Well, over this past year, many of you have experienced having to reconsider many aspects of your life, right? And all of us as believers right now are currently considering and we're, we're wrestling with how do we relate to church? Because we've had to relate to church so differently over this past year. And whether we realize it consciously or even subconsciously, we're, we're all doing a certain kind of uh, cost-benefit analysis, kind of a risk-benefit. What are the trade-offs, you know? I mean, if we're honest, it's pretty convenient to uh, grab a hot drink, stay in our pajamas, and enjoy church online. And, you know, some of you have experienced the, the fun and the flexibility of heading to the coast for the weekend or the mountains, right? And you enjoy the weekly worship on, on your device, on our YouTube channel, while you're parked overlooking the ocean. And, and following which, you, <laughs> you grab a picnic lunch down in the sand. I mean, how awesome is that, right? So whatever ways you've adapted over the past year with your life and how you've related to church, we are all confronting major challenges in this new reality. And one significant area for us as believers is church. 
How do we relate to church? How should we be as a church? We face the stark reality that having gone through this crisis, we've, we've seen the different roles. Uh, the role of the institutional church. Uh, and, and we've seen the role of, of the local church, right? And, and there's benefits and limitations at all levels of our church structure. And it's likely that this pandemic will fan the flames of the conversation about the need to reform our church structures, to readdress these issues. And of course, that's been an ongoing conversation for some over the last 20 to 30 years. And as we discussed last week, on an individual level, crisis is a great revealer. In other words, under pressure, under difficult circumstances, our faith is tested and it reveals to a certain extent where we're at in our journey of faith. However, crisis is a great revealer corporately on an institutional level as well. And, and as local churches, we as individual believers have been challenged by uh, the guidelines that have been put, put in place by the institutional church. And we've all experienced the ongoing tension of, of local church uh, bodies struggling to remain faithful to the mission and being the body of Christ. You know, living out the New Testament one another commands and ministering to each other, supporting one another, encouraging one another, loving one another. And at the same time, serving our city, serving our community, being salt and light with the gospel of Jesus. As we together, the Visalia Adventist Church, as we imagine or reimagine church in the future, we wrestle with many of these challenges. And frankly, we're faced with tough choices. You're faced with tough choices. We're faced with tough choices. And just as we corporately are being challenged with some of these difficult decisions, you're facing in your family some tough choices right now, perhaps. So as we continue this series about being church in a post-pandemic world, I want to build on last week's message, which began with this important point. The only faith worth having is a faith that works when life doesn't. The only faith worth having is a faith that works when life doesn't. And we want to continue building on this theme over the next three Sabbaths. A faith that doesn't work when life doesn't work, well, man, what is that worth, right? It's really of no use to anybody. And so we've been talking about how do we discover, how do we develop a deeper faith, a faith that lasts, a practical faith, a faith that helps in tough times, a faith that gives you hope. And purpose. And yes, even dare I say, happiness in the midst of crisis. A faith that works when life doesn't. We all know that life doesn't always work out the way we want. And last week we talked about how important it is to be anchored to the solid rock of God's word when life's storms come. And this morning, I want to talk about our tough choices and how can we make tough choices easier. We're all dealing with many difficult choices. And there's going to be more difficult and challenging choices and decisions that we're going to have to make in the days ahead. So before we jump into the book of James, into our study in God's word today, I want to share with you seven typical responses to crisis. Now, it's likely that you're going to recognize yourself in these over the past 12 months. The first phase or the first response is generally denial. Now, you've seen this in people, you know, initially when the COVID thing hit, it, you know, it's not my problem. Um, it, it's people are dealing with it in other countries. It's not even in this country. And, and even then, it may not even be real right? So phase one is denial. And then phase two is dismissal. Now in the phase of dismissal, this is the point where you go from denial, you go from saying, okay, it may not be real, uh, to okay, it's real, but it's no big deal. You know, it's not going to last very long. This should be over in a few weeks. And, and so we just kind of dismiss it. 
But eventually, people get to this third phase, and we've seen this over this past year. Defiance, right? I mean, and we've all felt a certain level of defiance in dealing with all the guidelines and, and the restrictions that we've had to work around. So now this phase is, is, is telling us that, okay, I, I'm going to refuse to let this limit my freedom. I'm not going to let this uh, cramp my, my style, right? Hey, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm just not going to stay home like they're asking us to. Well, that's defiance. But eventually, over time, most people move into stage four, which is delayed acceptance. And this is where we acknowledge, okay, this really is bigger than I thought it was going to be. I, I'm, I, I'm seeing that this is going to affect me. And so there's this gradual, finally it dawns on us, and we finally accept the reality that we're dealing with. Then stage five is disruption. Now, in disruption, and, and of course, all of these kind of overflow and intermingle with one another, right? So we have felt a variety of, the, uh, of, of these different responses at different times over the last 8 to 12 months. But, but disruption is where life has been turned upside down, right? And, and here are tough choices. You know, how are we going to deal with kids not being in school? Uh, for some, they lost their jobs. Small businesses were, have been struggling to stay afloat. Some still are. And then there's been those families that have been infected by uh, the virus or, or other illness, right? So we've been facing all kinds of tough choices, and right now we still are. Perhaps you're dealing with financial choices, or, or you could be dealing with relational choices. And certainly in all of this, we can't ignore spiritual choices. And at some point in this process, in the midst of all this disrupt, uh, disruption, we move through the phase of distress. You know, at some point, it, 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 man, this is not going away anytime soon. Uh, everything is changing. Man, this is unprecedented. We've never experienced a, a global pandemic like this in our lifetimes. And it causes people a lot of distress. People experience stress in their lives, right? Well, the goal is to get to phase seven, which is determination. Now, here's where, as believers, we say, all right, by God's grace, I'm going to get through this, right? By God's grace, we together can make it, and we're, de we're determined to go through it together. And so today, I want to talk about decision-making, because life is a series of choices, a series of decisions. I mean, think about it. First, we make our choices, and then our choices make us, right? Choices develop our character or not. And given the past 12 months, many of you today are facing some very tough choices. So the question I really want to get after today in our time together in God's Word is, how does trusting God make tough choices easier? Well, let's go, go in our Bibles to the book of James, where we were last week in James chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. Notice what the Bible says. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Now, before digging into these verses, I want to just talk about tough choices in general. Right? I mean, sometimes when we're faced with a decision, there are clear advantages in one direction or there's, there's very clear disadvantages in another direction. And even when we know what we should do, right, and, and we, we know this from experience, seldom is the right thing the easy thing, right? I, I mean, we see the advantage, we know we should go this way, not that way, but man, it's hard and I don't know, I'm wrestling with whether I'm going to really want to commit uh, to doing that. But there are some tough decisions where there is no clear benefit 
one way or the other. I mean, you could be uh, faced with a tough decision between two good things. Two equally good things. Or you could also be faced with two painful things. And these two things are, are equally painful, right? So right now, wherever you are, I want you to think about something specific. A tough choice or a decision that you're facing. Next week, in the near future, you know, whether it's something about finances or health, whether it's about your work and career, uh, it could have to do with kids in school, it could have to do with continuing your education, your relationships, whatever. Think of something specific, a tough choice, a decision that you're facing next week, and you're having a hard time deciding what to do. How will trusting God make decision-making easier. Here's what the Bible says. We just read it in James, right? When I trust God, he gives me his wisdom. If any of you need wisdom, you should ask God, and it will be given to you. God is generous and won't correct you for asking. Church, often we, we don't have God's wisdom because we don't ask. James is telling us that we should pray and ask God who gives generously to anyone who asks. God doesn't resent it when you ask. God loves you. God loves to help you. And God will give you his wisdom. All you need to do is ask. Now, in the book of Proverbs, there's listed probably 30 plus uh, or more practical benefits of wisdom. Let's look at just a couple this morning. Proverbs 3 and verse 18, those who become wise are happy. Wisdom will give them life. Getting wisdom is the most important thing you can do. Proverbs 4, beginning in verse 7, whatever else you get, get insight. Love wisdom and she will make you great. Embrace her and she will bring you honor. You're going to need God's wisdom in your life. And God's wisdom is the opposite of the world's wisdom, right? Getting wisdom is, is the most important thing. It's not money. It's not fame. It's not pleasure. Wisdom is more important than success. And in fact, wisdom will bring some of these other things, right? In other words, if you seek after wisdom and you ask God for his wisdom, you'll be, a, you'll be blessed. You'll be happier. You'll, you'll be smarter. You'll have more success in your life. Things will be more positive. But we need God's wisdom in our lives. Why? Because we're human. All of us are imperfect. And what that means is that because we're imperfect, there's the possibility, and it's a high possibility, that some of our choices that we make are going to be mistakes. They're going to be the wrong decisions. I mean, how many times, looking back over your life, have you made a wrong decision, right? It could be as minor as uh, paid too much for something or or you gave up too soon, or you waited too long, or you said the wrong thing. I mean, so much of the pain in our lives is a result of foolish decisions and, and, and bad choices that we've made. And that's why we need God's wisdom. Notice Proverbs 24 and verse 14. You may be sure that wisdom is good for the soul. Get wisdom, and you have a bright future. Maybe right now, the future doesn't look so bright for you. Maybe your future doesn't look so secure. But the Bible says, if you seek after God's wisdom, if you ask for God's wisdom, if you receive God's wisdom, your future is bright. So number one, when I trust God, he gives me his wisdom. If I ask. Number two, when I trust God, he frees me from second guessing. Notice Proverbs 17 and verse 24. Anyone with wisdom knows what makes good sense, but fools can never make up their minds. So the question is, am I depending on my wisdom or am I depending on God's wisdom? 
Now, uh, some of you are really good at torturing yourself with self-doubt and, and second-guessing yourself, right? And you ask, why can't I just make up my mind? Well, sometimes we're second-guessing ourselves because we're trying to handle it on our own. We're depending on our wisdom. We're not depending on God's wisdom. And that brings us back to the book of James, James 1, here in verse 6. But when you ask God, you must believe and not doubt. Anyone who doubts is like a wave in the sea, blown up and down by the wind. Church, we are experiencing a season of ever-changing winds. Over the past year, especially as it related to the virus, I mean, the winds changed by the hour. I mean, you watch the news in the morning, and it's one thing about face masks. And then by evening news, it's something else. So here's what we do. Here's the guidelines. Here's, here's what's recommended. And then it changes, right? It drive you crazy. Well, in the days and months ahead, things are going to continue to change. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be tossed back and forth like a wave by ever-changing winds. And God's instruction to us is don't be, don't be double-minded. Because if you are, you're not going to receive my, my wisdom, right? Notice verse 7, James 1 here. Such doubters are thinking two different things at the same time. And they cannot decide about anything they do. They should not think they will receive anything from the Lord. You see, when we're double-minded, we, we second-guess ourselves. And, and when we doubt ourselves, it causes us to be unstable. According to the Bible, it makes us unstable in all that we do. I don't know if you've heard about the psychologist that asked his client, are you indecisive? And the person responded, well, yes and no. Well, I used to be, but now I'm not sure. I mean, we've all kind of experienced that, right? Double-mindedness, it creates instability in our, within ourselves, our emotions. And double-mindedness also creates instability in our relationships. More than that, double-mindedness creates an unstable spiritual life. Double-mindedness weakens our faith. Double-mindedness leads to a faith that doesn't work. All right, so let's review. When I have a tough decision to make, trusting God's, God makes tough choices easier. So first, he gives me his wisdom when I ask for it. Secondly, he sets me free from self-doubt and second-guessing when I trust him. Number, Number three, when I trust God, he acts on my behalf. You see, when we trust God, he acts. God moves into action. And, and sometimes God's action is seen, but, but sometimes it's unseen, right? Uh, sometimes God is moving mountains on your behalf and you just can't see it right now. I mean, how many times in hindsight, right, did you see that, wow, God really was working, even though I couldn't see it. God, God knew what he was doing all along. Hmm, imagine that. Church, God is not moved by our whining, by our complaining and griping. God works on our behalf and he moves mountains and barriers in our lives when we trust him. Trusting God moves God to action. Now, earlier, I asked you to think of something specific, a tough choice that you're wrestling with right now, a difficult decision that, that you're needing to make. God is asking you, will you trust me? Will you trust me or will you try to handle it on your own? You see, God wants us to have a faith that works when life doesn't. And if our faith is depending on our own wisdom, it isn't going to work, especially during times of crisis. Notice Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 27. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him. 
calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him. And he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, will it be done to you? And their sight was restored. Did you get that? According to your faith, it will be done for you. And in this sense, you get to choose how much God can bless your life, right? Because you make the choice to what extent you're willing to trust God, to surrender to God, to invite his wisdom into your life. You see, to what extent you surrender to God, then that's the extent that God can take action on your behalf. You know, are, are you trusting him or are you trusting yourself? Are we trusting God's wisdom or are we depending on the world's wisdom? According to your faith, it will be done for you. In conclusion this morning, let me give you one more. Number four, and, and this is a big encouragement. When I trust God, he uses even my mistakes. Now, what am I saying? What I'm saying is that when I trust God, even if I make a wrong decision, God will bring good out of it. In other words, I can't lose. Now, we understand that some choices are definitely better than others, right? And, and when we make a bad choice, there are often consequences that follow, right? We reap what we sow. And, and in some cases, there's no way to avoid some negative consequences to a bad choice. But even if I get it wrong, even if I make a mistake, God can still bring good into my life. Most of you are familiar with the promise in Romans 8 and verse 28, right? We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. I love the way the message words this verse in Romans. Let's read it. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Isn't that beautiful? We can be sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. Wow, that helps the stress level go way down, right? I mean, that dramatically drops stress for us. We still want to make good decisions. We need, still need to seek the right decisions in God's wisdom, yes. But even if we make a wrong decision, God says, you know what? That's okay. That wasn't my plan. That wasn't ideal. That wasn't the best decision you could make. But I'll bring good out of it. By my sovereign power, I'll figure out a way to fit it into the plan. I'll use it. I'll go ahead and bring good into your life. You can relax. Church, this is an amazing promise to remember when we're faced with making a tough decision, when we're faced with making a tough choice. The world has changed dramatically over these last 12 months. We are faced with a new reality, individually and corporately. You are facing some tough choices we, together, corporately as the church, as the body of Christ here in Visalia, we're facing some challenging circumstances right now. We're facing some difficult decisions. And the only faith worth having is a faith that works when life doesn't. That's the kind of faith I want. And I know that's the kind of faith you want. So how does trusting God make tough choices easier? Number one, when I trust God, he gives me his wisdom if I ask. Number two, 
when I trust God, he frees me from second guessing. Number three, when I trust God, he acts on my behalf. And number four, when I trust God, he uses even my mistakes. Now that's a faith that works.
As you move forward into this next week, I pray that as you wrestle with that tough decision that you're dealing with, that you will seek God's wisdom, that you will ask him for his wisdom, and that you will not depend on the world's wisdom and try to handle it yourself. That we recognize that when we trust God, it makes tough decisions easier. May you find the Holy Spirit's help and assistance and guidance in the coming week as you wrestle with your tough decisions. God bless you, church. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next time.